Hi, I'm Andrea Wolf, CEO of the Brem Foundation to Defeat Breast Cancer, and I'm thrilled to be with you here today. Some of you have been with us before, and some are new and, and some are new friends, but all of you are in for a remarkable program. This program is unlike anything we've done before. But before we get started, I want to tell you a bit more about why Brem is so special. The Brem Foundation is a nonprofit based in the DC area, but serves women across the country. BREM maximizes women's chances of finding early curable breast cancer through education, access, and advocacy. Our education programs teach women about risk factors, screening options, and how to ask for the care they need and deserve. Our access programs pay for biopsies and free rides to breast care appointments for women in need. I'm especially proud of Wheels for Women, the country's first and only ride sharing program dedicated exclusively to breast care. Finally, our advocacy work centers around opening access to screenings beyond mammograms to wide swaths of women in DC and across the country. In fact, the Brem Foundation led the effort to pass DC's first breast density law that includes insurance coverage for screenings beyond mammograms, like ultrasounds and MRIs. Today, we're here to kick off Breast Cancer Awareness Month together. This is always a busy and exciting time for Brem, but this year is especially exciting because we're launching three new PSA videos. But we could not be here without the generous support of our hostesses and sponsors. I'm especially grateful to our sponsors for this year's Brem for the Bust. Judith Burson, Drs. Rachel and Henry Brem, Heather Diamond, the Butchko Family Foundation, Bayside Auto Group, Doyle Coleman in honor of Deborah Coleman, and an anonymous do donor in honor of Drs. Rachel and Henry Brem have been so generous. We're also grateful to our media sponsor, Southern Maryland Women Magazine. I would be remiss in not mentioning Brem's off the scale staff and board. Thank you for your tireless passion and commitment. Everyone at today's event is entered to win a gorgeous Martin's butterfly necklace. Please stick around for a minute or so after the program to hear the lucky winner. And now it's my honor and pleasure to introduce my friend, Sean Yancey. Sean is an Emmy award-winning broadcast journalist and evening news anchor at NBC4 in Washington. She also founded and leads Girls Night Out by Sean Yancey Inc., a nonprofit dedicated to empowering and improving the lives of underserved women and children. She lives in Montgomery County, Maryland with her husband, her three wonderful sons and two dogs. 
Welcome, Sean. Andrea, thank you so much. Good afternoon, everybody. I am so excited to be here with you as we kick off Breast Cancer Awareness Month. I want to let you all know that you are in for a huge treat this afternoon. Today, the Brim Foundation, as you heard, is unveiling three brand new education videos, and you guys are going to be the very first people who are able to see them. First, we're going to watch the videos. We're going to take them in, and then after each video, our renowned physicians, Dr. Rachel Brim and Dr. Lena Nathan, are going to come on, and they're going to break down the most important breast take takeaways from those videos. And we're also going to discuss why these messages are so vital, not only for you, but also to share with your loved ones and with your friends. Before we roll those videos, though, it will be my pleasure to introduce those doctors to you, Dr. Brim and Dr. Nathan. First, Dr. Rachel Brim is the director of the Breast Imaging and Intervention at the George Washington University Medical Center, professor of radiology, vice chairman of the Department of Radiology. Dr. Brim has served as the Brim Foundation's chief medical officer and inspiration since the Brim Foundation Foundation's inception in 2006. She is a zealous advocate for early detection and certainly has dedicated her career to finding effective and innovative ways to increase breast cancer prevention and early detection. And she is also a breast cancer survivor and thriver. Dr. Lena Nathan specializes in comprehensive care for women, including well women visits, obstetrics, gynecology, gynecologic surgeries. Her focus lies in promoting the well being of women of all ages, ranging from adolescence all the way through menopause. She also believes strongly in patient empowerment through communication. Dr. Nathan's favorite part of being a doctor is helping women have healthy pregnancies and deliveries. Doctors Brim and Nathan, thank you both so much for being here with us this afternoon. I am delighted to be here and to kick off Breast Cancer Awareness Month, particularly with you, Sean, who has been such a stalwart supporter of the Brim Foundation. So thank you. Dr. Nathan, you want to say say hello to everybody real quick? Yes, hi. Thank you so much. It is my honor and privilege to be here um, representing UCLA Health as, as well as um, everything that we as physicians do for our patients. So thank you for inviting me. We are glad to hear have you here, and we are glad to have everyone who is joining us this afternoon. Uh, also coming up in our program, later you're going to hear from Jacqueline Beal, an inspiring and tireless breast cancer advocate, and also from Cheryl, Cheryl Skillen, the co-founder and chair of the Brim Foundation Board. We're going to try and wrap things up around 1.30 this afternoon, but for anyone who wants to stay on just for a few extra minutes, Dr. Brim and Brim CEO Andrea Wolf will remain here to answer a few more of your questions in the Q&A box, so remember if you have some, feel free to start putting your questions in there. And also, as we're going throughout the program, let us know what you're thinking. Give us a little pound or some, some jazz hands uh, in, the, in the chat just to let us know that you're here. And you, thank you, yes, you, we appreciate everything you guys are doing. Uh, first, let's take a look at our first video. You know, a visit to your primary care provider or OBGYN is certainly an important time to discuss and map out your personalized screening plan. This first video, Let's Talk About Breast Baby, will set you up with the most important questions to ask about your breast health. Take a look. This is a doctor's office. You find yourself waiting here. Your clothes are folded. You feel weird wearing this gown and the air conditioner is a bit too strong. It is moments like this where you could change everything. No, not like that. I mean, for your health. How? Simply just by asking questions. You and your doctor are a team. Team your health. Woo! And if your team's gonna win, then you need to get in the game. All right, no more sports metaphors, I promise. Here are the top questions to ask your doctor about breast cancer. Number one, does my family history matter when it comes to breast cancer? The more people in your family who've had it, the younger they were when they were diagnosed, and the closer they are related to you, the higher your chances are of getting it. If you have a strong family history, ask your doctor about genetic testing. It's really important. Family history raises your risk of breast cancer, but even if you don't have breast cancer in your family, you're still at risk. Number two, do I have dense breasts? Half of women over age 40 have dense breast tissue. It's natural and normal. Density matters because dense tissue looks cloudy on a mammogram. This means cancer is really hard to see. 
For women with dense tissue, mammograms without other screenings can hide up to 50% of cancers. Not great. On top of that, dense tissue makes it four to six times more likely that you will get breast cancer. You can't tell if you have dense breasts by how they look or feel. The only way to tell if you have dense breasts is to have a mammogram. Which leads us to our next question. Number three, do I need more than a mammogram? Some women need screenings in addition to a mammogram, like if you have dense breasts. On an ultrasound, the dense tissue is still white, but the cancer is black, making it easier to see. For people with very dense tissue, an MRI might be the right tool. It's like the superhero of finding cancer. In some states, insurance must cover breast ultrasound and MRI. If yours doesn't, talk to your doctor or navigator for next steps and options for support. Asking your doctor about these essential tests in addition to your mammogram could save your life. Number four, how often should I get screened and what tests do I need? Early detection is the key to fighting breast cancer. If you find it early, you have a 95% chance of beating it. So talk to your doctor about screening every year starting at age 40, if you're at average risk, and earlier if you have other risk factors. Not all doctors agree on when to start and how often, but the data shows that starting at 40 will save the most lives. It could be a game changer. You're probably thinking, I'll never remember everything I learned today. And you're probably right, which is why we wrote all this down for you on a web page. This whole video, this set, these lights, the camera guy, the props, the Brem Foundation, this whole team have come together to make this video. And we did this for you. And that's because you are the key to pushing back on breast cancer. Early detection is so powerful, it could save your life. If you get engaged and, dare I say, get in the game, you could change everything. So be brave. Ask these questions, and if you forget, visit breasthealthquestions.org for a free downloadable list. Lastly, share this video with someone you love. Wow, uh, the video was incredible. And I know that many of you are watching this. Give us some feedback in the chat if you can. And just a reminder, in case you did not have a chance to write it down, if you want to see that again and share it with your friends, it is breasthealthquestions.org. All right, we want to bring in Dr. Brim and Dr. Nathan to sort of talk about some of the things that we saw in that video. Dr. Nathan, I'm going to start with you. Um, in the video, and certainly we've heard that you should be 40 when you start your screenings. But, but what what should a patient do if her doctor does not recommend that she start these screenings at age 40 if she's of average risk? So patients should advocate for themselves and ask for a mammogram beginning at age 40. There is good evidence that this can save lives. The, in fact, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology does recommend starting annual screening at age 40. And this is something that's important to bring up to your doctor, even with written material and evidence if they need in order to start recommending mammograms. Dr. Graham, do you want to jump in on that one? Yeah, definitely. So it's important to realize that the data is overwhelming that if you start mammography at the age of 40, every year, more American women will be saved. And if there are many organizations now that do not recommend starting mammograms until the age of 50 for various reasons, but you should know that you do not need a referral for a screening mammogram, that you can go to most breast centers without a referral. And you should also know that a screening mammogram does not have any uh, copay or deductible, it is free. So you can advocate for yourself, you can have the discussion with your physician if they still don't recommend or give you a referral, then march yourself into a breast center, preferably a center of excellence, get your mammogram. It's free. It's life-saving. Great advice. Dr. Brem, what should a patient do if she needs genetic testing based on her family history, but is too nervous to find out if she might have that genetic mutation? Sean, that's a great question. And the answer is that you should have a discussion with a genetic counselor. There are two things that you really need to remember. One is having a discussion with a genetic counselor about the implications of getting genetically tested doesn't mean you're gonna get the test. It just means that you're gonna get the information. 
And secondly, you have the genes you have, whether you know it or not. And information is power. So if you do have a gene, you can be proactive and do things to prevent late stage breast cancer and actually prevent breast cancer. So it's important to remember, talk to a genetic counselor and getting the results doesn't change the genes you have. It just empowers you with the knowledge to do something proactively. And I think that's what's important to remember. It empowers you. Dr. Nathan, certainly we have all been through so much over the last 18 months as we've been in the midst of this ongoing pandemic. What advice do you have about getting screened during the pandemic? I know breast screenings dropped dramatically during the pandemic. Are they still down and, and, and where do we stand now? Yes, so last year, very few of my patients even came to visit me, let alone get any screening tests done. And uh, this year we are seeing an increase in the number of women who are resuming their annual care, including screening mammograms. I strongly encourage every woman to go get their annual mammogram. Radiology centers are safe. They're practicing social distancing. They're keeping everything sanitized. Missing your mammogram can really be the difference between life and death. So I am strongly encouraging my patients, as are all my physician colleagues, to please go get your mammogram. Dr. Brem, what should a patient do if her provider recommends certain tests in addition to the mammogram, like the ultrasounds or the MRI, but the insurance doesn't cover it or she's, she's underinsured or not insured for those sorts of uh, testing? You, you touched on it earlier, but what should they do? Well, women have to understand that they can call their insurance companies, that they can advocate. And I'm very proud to say that in D.C., by law, these additional tests are covered as a result of the bill that the Brem Foundation was fun, uh, fundamental in having passed. So find out if your state has this covered. And if it does, then get it. If it doesn't, call your insurance company and advocate for yourself. It's all about empowerment. And before we move on to the next video, I want to ask either one of you, um, again, we I want to go back to the pandemic, and I know just certain people have been scared or concerned. Any final words of advice that you want to give for anyone who might be watching right now who is still a little bit hesitant about going to get um, a testing like this in the midst of the pandemic? I'd really like to say something about that. We know that in March and April, breast cancer screening was down 90%. It is still not back up to what it was in pre-COVID time. The American Cancer Society has estimated that 10,000 additional Americans will die of their disease for lack of screening. So it's important, you, COVID is here, but we know how to deal with it. As, as Dr. Nathan said, radiology centers are very cognizant to the needs of safe patient care but get your mammogram, COVID is here, but cancer is here as well. And we actually are seeing larger later stage cancers. Get your screening, it's life-saving. All right, Drs. Brem and Drs. Nathan, thank you so much. Um, we saw this in the last video. We, it, we talked about a little bit, the video talked about having dense breast. Um, it is an independent risk factor for breast cancer that affects about half of women over the age of 40, but many women don't know enough about dense breast. Let's roll this next video. What are dense breast? Listen and learn. Can you spot the cancer on this mammogram? It's right there, pretty easy. This is a mammogram of a dense breast. Can you spot the cancer here? It's hiding right there. It's hard to see, and that's because of all this dense breast tissue. It's like trying to spot a particular cloud in an overcast sky. Cancer is so hard to find in dense breasts that dense tissue hides up to 50% of cancers on a mammogram. That means if you have dense breasts, your cancer could go undiagnosed. Not great. So the big question is, do you have dense breasts? Well, you could. Dense breasts are actually pretty natural and normal. Half of women over age 40 have them. They can be in large, small, perky, or saggy breasts. You can't tell if you have dense breasts by how they look or feel. There's no DIY kit from the store. Your horoscope can't tell. And there's no app for that. The only way to tell is to get a mammogram. When your results show up in the mail or a web-based portal, they should tell you how dense your breasts are. Sometimes they don't. And if that's the case, 
you should call your doctor and ask. So what can you do if you have dense breasts? Great news, you can ask for an ultrasound. It's not just for babies. On an ultrasound, the dense tissue is still white, but the cancer is black, making it easier to see. Kind of like that one friend you had growing up who was terrible at hide and seek. I can see you, Sarah. Breasts range in density from level A, not so dense, to D, extremely dense. If you have extremely dense tissue, an MRI might be helpful. MRIs are like the Sherlock Holmes of detecting cancer in dense breasts, but it's not right for everyone. So talk to your doctor. Do you have dense breasts? Find out. And if you do, ask for an ultrasound or MRI every year in addition to your mammogram. In some states, insurance must cover breast ultrasounds and MRIs. If yours doesn't, talk to your doctor or navigator for next steps and options for support. This can't happen without you. So be brave and advocate for yourself. It could save your life. If you can't remember all this information or just want more, visit breasthealthresources.org for free educational downloads. All right, uh, another incredibly informative video. And um, I wanna bring back Drs. Nathan and Dr. Brim because I wanna ask you guys a couple of questions about this. Um, so I don't, first I wanna ask you about the language because I know um, having gotten mammograms over the years and being someone who has dense breasts, we've heard the term 3D mammograms and I wanna ask how that, what's the difference between that and the ultrasound and the MRI? I'll let either one of you jump in here before we, we get to some of the other questions, just so we understand the language. So 3D mammograms uh, take multiple images of the breast and image the breast in, in small sections so that overlapping breast tissue um, doesn't hide cancers. And, and on mammograms, cancer is white and breast tissue is white. So therefore, you heard about dense breast tissue. On ultrasound, breast cancers are black and breast tissue is white. So it helps us find it's actually better contrast to find cancers than, than in mammography. And MRI is a very expensive test that requires an injection of a contrast um, and is the most sensitive way of finding breast cancer. And that's why we relegate that to the highest risk women. But we, we have a tool chest to help find cancers in a personalized way for a woman's risk and breast density. Okay, thank you very much for clearing that up to help us understand a little bit. Um, Dr. Nathan, I know having dense breasts, um, should require us to ask for those additional tests as we talked about when, or if for either one of you, whoever wants to jump in on this one, how does that conversation play out in real life with your patients when they come in? Do you find that most people actually, most women have heard of, of dense breast or is this something new to a lot of patients? I will tell you honestly, most women have no clue about breast density. And that's why this educational event and these PSAs are so important. Um, women need to know that there are different densities to their breasts. And it is something that I always address when I do the breast exam or review mammography results, um, that there are different classes of density. And if you're a class C or a class D, an ultrasound in addition to the mammogram is very important because cancers can be missed on that mammogram. Okay. Um, Dr. Brem, can, can, can the density change over time or is it the same from, you know, when you're, you're, you're a teenager all the way through, you know, when you're a senior? So density tends to decrease as you get older and about 70% of women in their 40s have dense breasts, but even 30% of women in their 70s have dense breasts. Uh, that being said, each woman's density can only be determined by a mammogram, as you heard on the video, can't tell by feeling or seeing or saggy or perky. So um, it's only on a mammogram, it does change with age, and it can change with other things as well, like if you take hormone therapy, which increases your risk of breast cancer and also increases your risk of breast density. Uh, but generally, over time, it does decrease. Dr. Nathan, um, is there a particular demographic that's more likely to have denser breasts than others? And if so, why? So we do see denser breasts, as Dr. Brem mentioned, in younger women, um, because the breast tissue is less fatty. It's more glandular um, as, uh, you know, women use their breasts to nurse babies. And uh, we have milk ducts and, you know, much denser tissue during that phase of our lives. But it is important to realize um, 
that this can hide cancer. So definitely the younger demographic tends to have denser breasts. And just a reminder, again, if you guys want to see the videos again, go to breasthealthquestions.org, share them with your family, share them with your friends. All right, let's move on now to our third video, Am I Too Young? We know that women of average risk should begin their screenings around the age of We get it. Breast cancer is not something we want to think about. It's unpleasant. Kind of like this and this. We can't magically make it pleasant by sugarcoating it, but we can give you some tools that could help you change everything and maybe make it less scary. Let's start with the good news. If you find breast cancer early, you can almost always beat it. The bad news is that many women still find breast cancer too late when it's a lot harder to deal with. That is where you come in. Just by learning about breast cancer and the steps you can take before it's a big problem, you could turn the tide and take control of your breast health. Here are three things that could change your life, really. Number one, monthly breast self-exam. Take your health into your own hands. Because nearly 80% of young women diagnosed with breast cancer find their own breast abnormality. That's amazing. Your hands could save your life. Which is why you should start doing self-exams by age 20. Try to do it the same time every month, ideally in the week after your period. Every breast has lumps and bumps. That's normal. If you do a self-exam every month, you'll feel if something new pops up. If you find something new, go to your doctor. If you don't know how to do a self-exam, there are lots of great videos that can show you, or you can ask your doctor's office. Number two, find out if you need to get screened before 40. Every woman should get screened every year starting at 40, but some risk factors like family history or genetics may mean you should start sooner. For example, if you have a first degree relative like your mom or sister who had breast cancer young, you should ask your doctor about genetic testing, and you should ask around. See if anyone's had breast cancer in your family, Number three, be a secret weapon. Take what you've learned and make sure your moms, aunts, and grandmas who should be screening every year get the care they need. If you make breast health a priority, they'll listen, make their appointment, take them to lunch, make it happen. Just to recap, learn your family history, do a self-exam every month, be a secret weapon for the women you love. And if you think you might not remember everything in this video, Go to checkmybreast.org and download a free self-exam tutorial. You're awesome. You've got this. Um, another incredible and informative video. I'm going to bring back Dr. Nathan and Dr. Brim now to ask them a few questions about what we just learned right there. And I hope that there are some 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 women who are joining us um, who are um, under the age of 40. So this can be informative for them as well. Um, Dr. Nathan, is there an age that is too early to start thinking about or to know about breast cancer and breast health? It is never too early to learn about breast health, to learn what your breasts feel like, to learn about what screening is available. Um, this is a conversation we start with young women, even at the age of 18 or in their 20s, about just feeling your breasts, knowing what things feel like. If something doesn't feel right or feels different, please make an appointment with your doctor to have an exam and um, possibly undergo some imaging as well. It is never too early. Dr. Brim, um, say a person has um, uh, a diagnosis. Well, we know sometimes diagnoses these days are trending younger than they used to. Um, is there a reason for that? And what are you guys seeing in your practices? Are younger women coming in and asking to be screened these days? So we are seeing a younger uh, population of women with breast cancer, and it's actually uh, uh, ethnically different as well. So black women get breast cancer at a younger age, they get more aggressive cancers, they get triple negative breast cancers, 
And in fact, the American College of Radiology this year included all women of color um, as a higher risk group. So they need to talk to their physicians about screening earlier. In addition, um, it's never too early to, there's two things that I think are really important for young women to know. It's never too early to think about it. It's never too early, as Dr. Nathan said, to learn your own breasts. And that way, if, some, if something does change, then you will know it. And perhaps most importantly, we do think of breast cancer as a disease that occurs in older women, but a quarter of breast cancers occur in younger women. And the real negative or harmful or difficult consequences of that is that in my own practice, I'll often see this young woman in her late 20s, early 30s come into my office and say, you know, I've been telling my doctor about this for a year and they've been telling me I'm too young for breast cancer, but it grew and they reassured me that it was a cyst. So the most important thing to remember is nobody knows you as well as you know you. And if you think something's wrong, then you go seek the counsel of another doctor because doctors are well-meaning and caring, but we're human and we make mistakes. And at the end of the day, the consequences of those mistakes can be dire and can be really um, so difficult for young women. I've seen, and I'm sure Dr. Nathan has as well, patients certainly in their 20s, 30s um, with breast cancer. So if you don't get the answer and you believe something's wrong with you, don't be a good girl, advocate for yourself, seek the counsel of another doctor because nobody knows you as well as you know you. Agreed. Dr. Nathan, you want to weigh in on that? Yes, I 100% agree with Dr. Brem. Um, definitely, I have seen patients diagnosed with breast cancer in their 20s and 30s. Um, a woman who feels a lump, you should definitely get imaging for it. If you have breast pain, ask for imaging. There, any reason that your breasts don't feel right, it, it's important to follow up. So I agree with Dr. Brem, be your own advocate. If your doctor is not agreeing with you or something doesn't sound right, find a second opinion. Um, it, it's just so important. Those early diagnoses can really make a difference. Dr. Nathan, I wanna follow up with, um, if, if someone thinks or they know they have a genetic mutation in their family, at what age would you recommend someone uh, start getting their daughters or recommend their daughters be tested for that mutation? That is a great question. And it's really very personalized, that discussion. I will send my patients to a genetic counselor so that they can hear all the risks and benefits. I've done that as early as age 18. Generally, my patients will start getting screened for genetic mutations in their 20s because they feel that's when they will likely do something about it. But it depends also on the age of the youngest relative who developed breast cancer. If somebody had breast cancer in your family in their 20s and they had a genetic mutation, you may wanna start the counseling and the testing and the screening much earlier. All right, thank you both. And, and before we move on, I just wanna ask you both, give you an opportunity. Is there anything else that you wanna add that maybe we, we didn't touch on that you wanna share with the audience right now? As, as we launch Breast Cancer Awareness Month, I implore every woman listening here to get your mammogram starting at the age of 40 every year if you're at average risk. You will hear so much noise about starting at 40, 45, 50 every year, every other year. But if there's one message that you need or two messages you need to take, it's get your mammogram every year and get risk-based screening. If you're dense breasts, make sure that you ask for and get a screening ultrasound. And if you're at very high risk, an MRI as well. You wanna jump in Dr. Yeah. Nathan or are you just, were you giving us the thumbs up? Yes, I <laughs> echo everything Dr. Brem is saying and this is just such an important message and I'm glad that this program is happening today and there's so many participants uh, watching. So just very grateful for this message. Absolutely. Dr. Bram, Dr. Nathan, thank you both so much for your insight. We appreciate it.
All right, everybody, please help me welcome a close friend of the Brim Foundation, Jacqueline Beal. Jacqueline is passionate about ensuring access to adequate, affordable, and integrated health care. She's a national ambassador for the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network, a volunteer for the American Cancer Society, breast cancer ambassador, and patient family advisory council member for Suburban Hospital and a two-time 18-year breast cancer survivor and thriver. Please help me welcome Jacqueline Beal. Jacqueline. Thank you, Sean. I'm delighted to be here and I'm honored that I can share my story as a survivor. So my story begins with my family. Uh, my grandmother had brain cancer. My mom was diagnosed with breast cancer. I have a first cousin who had breast cancer. And the ironic thing in my family it appears that the oldest female sibling of every generation is being diagnosed with cancer and being diagnosed in, in, in their 30s. So I was a caregiver for my mother. So I knew enough um, to make sure and be vigilant about my own health and do my self breast exam. So one day while doing so at the age of 40, back in 2002, I discovered a lump. So I went to my doctor she agreed something was wrong and she sent me to to first have a sonogram and then for a mammogram and interestingly both came back clear so i didn't know then i know now that that was likely a result of we've talked a lot about it breast density so she recommended me for a biopsy and uh i remember i got a call about the biopsy results in a way that i hadn't envisioned for the start of this journey i was at work the phone rang, the radiologist asked, how was I doing? So I turned it back and said, well, you tell me, how am I doing? But the weird thing about the call was that I could hear a lot of noise in the background. And I asked, where are you? Because it didn't sound like a quiet place where you would think results would be delivered. And the response I got back was, I'm in New York trying to hail a cab and you have breast cancer. I realized then this was going to be an interesting journey and I was going to have to one advocate for myself and surround myself with lots of love and laughter. And so I finished my work day there wasn't any need to run home and uh, two days later on my birthday, I was in my breast surgeon's office being advised that I had stage one breast cancer that I would have a lumpectomy, five rounds of chemotherapy, and six weeks of radiation. And one day while I was going through chemotherapy, you know, I'll share this story with you, give you some insight of how I, um, you know, remained inspirational <laughs> and was able to fight. My sister and her 10-year-old daughter, my niece, and I, we were writing together, talking about a book that was dealing with cancer. And this conversation prompted my niece to ask her mom, she said, you know, did my grandmother have cancer? And my sister replied, yes. And uh, she then asked, and she said, she died. And my sister said, yes. And then she said, and your, your mother um, had cancer and uh, she died. And uh, my sister said, yes, her grand, our grandmother. And my sister said, yes. And my niece said, and she died. And my sister said, yes. So you could see in this little girl's mind where she was going. And she got to the question that I knew was coming, which was, and Aunt Jackie has cancer. And I jumped in and responded immediately and said, yes, and I'm not going anywhere. And I knew then, and she didn't know, but she would be the main reason I needed to fight because I had to give her hope that guess what? Everybody who gets a diagnosis with cancer in our family is not gonna die. <laughs> Excuse me. And to make that happen, I got involved with organizations to fight back against the disease that affects so many people. And I wanted to make sure my niece, you know, never has to hear the word, you have cancer, because guess what? She happens to be the oldest female sibling of her generation. So if you recall what I shared previously, we, we definitely are watching her like a hawk. And so I try to use my story, my time, talent, and the power of my voice and the pen to push for things like increased funding and research and legislation that protects people who are diagnosed with cancer. So after completing my treatment, you know, I thought life was good. I was returning back to a normal life, not so much. 
a year and a half later, <laughs> the cancer had the audacity to return again in the same breath. I went through the same process because I felt the lump. I went to have a sonogram, a mammogram. They both came back clear again. I ended up having a biopsy. And by this time, naturally, the recommendation was to have a mastectomy. And I agree. It was like, okay, this breast is giving me way too much trouble. And let's just get rid of it. Give me a new one. Perk up the other one. And let me move on with my life. Um, and so I am delighted and overjoyed to say that it has been 18 years since then, and I am now a thriving, as Sean said, two-time breast cancer survivor. And I'd like to mention, you know, I have benefited from numerous life-saving advancements, such as 3D mammography that we touched on earlier. I have had genetic testing and counseling. Interesting enough, I don't have, I'm not, I don't have the gene, but, um, and I've benefited from clinical studies and trials as well. And because I'm still here, because I've survived, the second chapter of my life is dedicated to fighting for others who are gonna travel my journey. So I wanna to continue to ensure we have funding for research. We have legislation that protects cancer patients. Everyone has access to affordable and adequate health care, and that we are eliminating health disparities. And I hope through my voice and my story, we get some of that done. Thank you. Jacqueline, I mean, everybody, you know, if you can right now, give her the jazz hands. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, thank you for your inspiration. And we certainly thank you for your, your fight. We appreciate that. And I hope that someone who's listening right now will take that fight and continue that fight in their own lives, not only for themselves, but for their family and their friends and the generations that are coming behind them. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Thank you, Sean. All right, now please help me welcome Cheryl Skillen. Sharon was the original co-founder of the Brim Foundation in 2006. Since then, she has become the bedrock of this organization's success. Cheryl has served as secretary, board chair. Her persuasiveness and insight have led the Brim Foundation to greater heights than anyone could have ever dreamed. She is a leader in the breast cancer movement. Please help me welcome Cheryl Skillen. Cheryl? Thank you so much for that very warm welcome, Sean, and hello, everyone. You know, uh, Brum Foundation started when four friends found out about a group of women who were uninsured and needed financial assistance to receive necessary breast biopsies. So we got together, formed a foundation to raise money, help women, and spend more time together. From those humble beginnings, I am enormously proud of the women, the thousands of uninsured and underinsured women that we have helped through our, and the lives that we have saved through our B Fund and through our Wheels for Women program. And the number of women of all walks of life that we have saved through our, or that we have helped through our educational program is immeasurable. You know, Oprah Winfrey once said that when you educate a woman, you don't just impact one life, you impact families, you impact communities, because a woman will take what she's learned and teach it to others. When we started the foundation, digital mammography was just coming out and we wanted to make sure everyone had access to that and other valuable information, just like you've heard today. So we started having small educational events in women's homes, which quickly led to ballrooms. And thanks to modern technology, we're able to share that information to women all over the country, all over the world. We've had so many stories come out of women who have attended those events and were empowered to act. Stories like a woman who just knew something was wrong, even though her doctors kept telling her she was fine. She attended one of our events and she heard Dr. Brum say, you know you better than anyone else and you need to be your own advocate. That empowered her to keep pressing for answers. And she finally was able to get to a doctor who diagnosed her breast cancer at a very early stage. And today she is cancer free. Stories from women who were told that they had dense breasts, but were never told there was something else that they could do. And so after attending our events, they were empowered to ask for an ultrasound. And to Oprah Winfrey's point, 
So a story of a young woman in her 20s who attended one of our events and heard Dr. Brem say, you should never go to an operating room to get a biopsy. Well, come to find out, that woman's mother-in-law was scheduled to do just that in three weeks. This young woman went home, called her mother-in-law, shared the information that she heard. And the next day, the mother-in-law was in the doctor's office getting her biopsy and found out that she was fine. Now imagine the anxiety she was saved by not having to wait three weeks to have that biopsy done. Imagine the expense and the recovery she did not have to endure, all because her daughter-in-law attended a Brem Foundation educational event. So when I say the amount, the, the number of women that we have impacted over the last 15 years was immeasurable, you can see how. So we need your help. Our work is not done. There's a lot more to do. So please share the information that you've heard today with others. Schedule your mammogram and encourage others to do the same thing. And please make a donation today so that we can continue the fight to defeat breast cancer. As you can see on this screen, there are many ways that you can help. $28 provides a one-way ride to a breast screening. $290 covers the cost of a diagnostic mammogram. $25,000 provides 10 uninsured women or underinsured women to receive a diagnostic mammogram. $6,000 covers five biopsies for women in need. We have a $55,000 deficit of women, uninsured, un, uninsured women in need of financial assistance to receive breast biopsies that we're working to try to pay for. And our WHEELS program has cut the attention from other cities and we're getting requests to expand that program. So please pick up your phone now and make a donation. You can hover over this QR code to make the donation. Log on to our, our website, brumfoundation.org backslash donate. Or if you wanna contact us directly, you can do so at info at brumfoundation.org. Any amount is appreciated. Any amount will help and everything is appreciated. Ladies and gentlemen, with your help, we will continue saving lives, saving families, and saving communities. Together, with your help, we will continue making a difference in women's lives. Thank you so much. Cheryl, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for working tirelessly with the organization and to try to keep making advances every single day. Um, you heard everything that Cheryl had to say. So please, we ask you, if you can, go ahead and um, donate in a way that is meaningful to you. You can see how much work the Brim Foundation does for our community and beyond. Um, I just wanna thank you all so much for joining us for this incredibly informative and insightful discussion. I wanna thank you for the inspirational stories. Um, the videos were wonderful. Keep your questions coming in the Q&A box. Um, again, stick around after the conclusion of our formal program. If you have questions, uh, Dr. Brim and also Brim CEO and founder or CEO, Andrea Wolf will be joining you to answer some of those questions. And right now I wanna turn things over to Brim Foundation and CEO, Andrea Wolf. Thank you all for such a wonderful afternoon. Thank you, Sean. Sean, I can't tell you how happy I am that you were here with us today. Thank you to all of our wonderful panelists. Um, I may, may be a surprise to everyone, but I always learn something new and this was no exception. And I'm just honored to be here with you uh, and with everyone who was on. Um, thank you all so much. Now, before we conclude, um, I, I always work in threes, so I want to ask everyone who's still here with us to do three things today. The first thing that I'd like for you to do is to share these videos. We know from our former PSA that sharing the videos not only spreads information, but actually really does save lives. Um, you can uh, go to all of the websites that you see up here on the screen, breasthealthresources.org, checkmybreasts.org, and breasthealthquestions.org. They are actually all Brem Foundation uh, URLs and download the information and share it on your social. Please push it out as our uh, launch into Breast Cancer Awareness Month. 
The second thing is to support Brem, as Cheryl just mentioned, uh, every dollar counts. Um, as we live longer and longer with COVID, the support for Brem means more and more. Sadly, we are seeing more later stage diagnoses because people don't uh, have the resources to go to their breast care appointments, have forgotten about their breast care appointments, or are worried about COVID and going into a doctor's office. So the more that we can push, the, the earlier we're gonna find this disease and the fewer people that will suffer. So your support in any amount is incredibly meaningful. We will also have more volunteer opportunities coming up. So if you're interested in working hand in hand with us and getting into the trenches, um, please keep checking our website. Uh, and then finally, and most importantly, take care of yourselves get screened, commit to personalized screening this year. And I know this might sound crazy, but um, yes, take care of breast health, but take care of all of your health. Stay well, uh, do things that you know are going to be preventative care, both in terms of mental health and physical health. And we hope that you can continue to stay strong and join us in the future for many wonderful uh, more events. Um, I am also really excited to announce the winner of the beautiful Martin's butterfly necklace. There it is. You can see it right there. Uh, and the winner is Linnell McFadden. Congratulations, Linnell. Please, uh, we will be in touch with you uh, soon to see how you can get your beautiful jewelry. And now I'm going to uh, thank Dr. Nathan. Uh, Dr. Nathan is actually going to deliver a baby, bring another life into this world. Thank you so much, Dr. Nathan. It was really an honor to be with you. And we hope that now that you're part of the Brem family, that we will stay in close touch uh, and your voice can be a strong one uh, going forward for all women in breast health across the country. Thank you so much for including me. Thank you. Um, and now anybody who wants to stick around for a Q&A, we've gotten actually some phenomenal uh, questions in the, in the Q&A, keep them coming. Um, so let me start with one actually from someone who's been a long time uh, champion and fighter and friend of mine. Um, she asks, what is being done to educate physicians about breast density? My concern is that doctors are not having conversations with women about C and D density because they are not understanding the issue themselves. It's an issue that I myself encountered before a stage three C diagnosis. I was not told because the nurse practitioner felt like it was not a big deal. And I got a 3D mammogram that came out clean. So um, I'm happy to address that. Um, you know, there are many misconceptions about breast cancer and the Brem Foundation works diligently to try to break them down. One is that if you have a normal mammogram, you can't have breast cancer. So the person who asked this question, um, many others have learned the difficult way that you can have a normal mammogram and have breast cancer. And you saw that and a large reason for that is breast density. So we are trying to work with physicians uh, to explain to them the importance of not only breast density, but of, of important critical additional screening so that we have the best opportunity we can to find mammographically hidden, but early curable breast cancers. Um, there is the uh, Society of Breast Imaging, the American College of Radiology is working uh, on an educational campaign to further the information about breast density. But when you go to your primary care physician, there are so many things that they have to talk about, blood pressure, cholesterol, uh, colon cancer screening and breast cancer. And so once again, you really need to be your own advocate to bring up the fact that your mammogram uh, is dense and that you deserve and must get additional ultrasound screening. It is, mammography, by the way, is the only medical procedure that's mandated by law. And by law, every woman after a mammogram will get their result in the mail in, in language that they should be able to understand, including their breast density. So if you do get that in the mail, it does say that you have dense breasts and you haven't yet had a breast ultrasound, make sure that you reach out either to the center that you went to or a center in your town that does breast ultrasound to get that critical additional screening. And the last point is that 
with screening breast ultrasound in women with dense breasts, we find 25 more percent more cancers, a, a huge number. So, and that these are very important cancers. They're small node negative, the kind of cancers that you have to find to save lives. So we have to educate physicians and we have to educate and empower women that if their physician doesn't recommend it, they must advocate for it. Dr. Brem, are there any concerted efforts around educating physicians with breast, about de breast density? And if so, is it by society? Is it a certain type of physician that should start thinking about it more actively than they might be right now? Every physician, primary care physician that takes care of women, which is every physician, should know about dense breast tissue. However, they also are confounded and by the many different organizations that have different screening recommendations. And there, the American uh, College of Family Physicians recommends screening starting at the age of 50 and doesn't talk about adjunct screening or additional essential screening as you point out and you, you call it, Andrea. So um, that is why, yes, we, the Society of Breast Imaging is trying to educate women, um, lay women, as well as all physicians about the critical importance of breast density. But that's why it's really important for women to advocate for themselves because there is this lack of information even among physicians. Thank you so much. Um, we have another question asking, why should you not go to an operating room for a biopsy? That's a great question. The reason is because 80% of breast biopsies are benign. When we do imaging like mammography and ultrasound, we see masses, but we don't know if they're cancer or not often until we do the biopsy. Not only, so therefore with the vast majority of breast biopsies resulting in benign non-cancerous findings, there's no reason for women to be exposed to anesthesia, to um, the scars of surgery. Uh, and when it is equally effective and equally accurate to do image guided needle biopsies. In addition, studies have unequivocally shown that if a woman has breast cancer, and if we know it before she goes to the operating room, the likelihood that she can have one surgical procedure is much higher because if the surgeon knows that it's cancer, they'll do a wider excision and be more likely to get negative margins, that is not require additional surgery. Uh, surgery. However, if it's unknown with 80% of the biopsies resulting in benign findings, the surgeon will be more careful to take smaller amounts of tissue appropriately, but then more frequently will need to go back and a woman will have to be subjected to a second surgical procedure which not only is difficult um, anxiety producing, but also results in poor cosmetic outcome. Oh, there you are. Hi, um, Hi. thank you so much. Uh, another person wants to know if you have really dense tissue, will an MRI show cancer when a mammogram or an ultrasound doesn't? The answer to that is yes. So uh, uh, the, as I think the video said, MRI is the Sherlock Holmes of right. imaging technology. And that's because it shows us uh, more cancers than either mammography or ultrasound or even mammography plus ultrasound. So uh, the question is, why don't we use it? Well, one is it requires an injection of a contrast agent. Second of all, it's very expensive. Insurance companies are increasingly not approving MRI for dense breast tissue. The good news to that is that recently there was a law that was passed in the state of Pennsylvania by the governor that requires MRI coverage by insurance companies for women with extremely dense breast tissue or women who have um, moderately dense breast tissue and one other risk factor for breast cancer. So we're moving in the right direction. And in conjunction with that, uh, very recently, there was an outstanding study published actually from the Netherlands that showed that in women who have extremely dense breast tissue, screening MRI every other year, not only finds more cancers, but, but results in finding less interval cancers, that is cancers in between screening studies, which interval cancers have a worse outcome, worse prognosis and a higher death rate. So where we go in the future, if we have this discussion in a number of years, MRI will likely be having an increasing impact 
and more frequently utilized, not only for women at higher risk, but also for women who are higher risk by virtue of their fact of, the, of their breast density. So the answer, the long answer to a short question is yes, MRI will find more cancers than mammography and ultrasound, but no, it's not approved for everybody predominantly by the insurance companies. I don't see any more question and answers coming in. If anybody has one, please type it in your Q&A box because we don't have the chat enabled. I'll give it another minute or two. Um, but if I don't see anything else come up, please, anybody who's still with us, remember to share these videos. They do, oh, we have more. We do save lives. Um, uh, I'll, I'll read the question in a minute. Um, and support Brem and take care of yourselves. But we have an encore. Um, someone wants to know, uh, actually one of Dr. Brem's very grateful patients wants to know um, that whether the report that says that her breast tissue is 25 to 55, 25 to 50% glandular structures, should she be concerned about those types of percentages? And let me broaden that a little bit and say, how are patients supposed to interpret these types of language, this type of language and more medical jargon in relation to their breast density when they get their mammogram reports? If you could break it down by percentage, I think that would be really um, helpful. A terrific question and whoever you are, thank you for asking it. Um, so we look at breast density in 25% in, in quartiles. So anyone with zero, less than 25% is considered predominantly fatty. It's the one time fat is good, right? Um, 25 to 50 is also not dense. So anyone who has 50% dense tissue or less um, does not have dense breast tissue. Anyone who has 50% or more does. And the American College of Radiology uh, designates that as breast density categories A, B, C, and D. The caveat to that is that some people with less than 50% breast tissue have areas of their breasts that are extremely dense. And in those areas, breast cancers can hide as well. So the best question, if, if you're getting your mammography report and it says that you have A or B, you don't need screening ultrasound. If it has C or D density, then you should advocate for yourself and make sure that you do get uh, additional screening, predominantly ultrasound uh, today to evaluate women who have dense breast tissue. Thank you. Um, someone wrote in that she's a newly diagnosed triple negative breast cancer survivor currently in chemo treatment. She had a discussion with her breast specialist who advised that she uses a deodorant spray as opposed to a solid stick or roll on because of bacteria. All of the deodorant sprays are antiperspirant. She'd like your medical opinion regarding which one is better. That's a great question that people often ask about deodorant. Um, the answer is that I like to answer questions that are scientifically based with scientific data. We don't have a lot of data. We do have data that suggests that these antiperspirants and other deodorants are not carcinogenic. Um, but whether during chemo, when your white count is depressed, using one kind of deodorant uh, as opposed to a, another may be safer in terms of uh, bacteria um, is something that you should really ask your doctor about. I don't believe there's much data out there. So if you are much more comfortable using a stick, then go ahead. Um, and if not, then perhaps during the time of chemo, a, sp a spray by virtue of not touching your skin uh, may be better, uh, thereby having less bacteria. Thank you. Um, someone wants to know if there's anything she can do to make her breasts less dense. Yes, uh, you can age. So uh, um, there are a couple of things, of course, uh, in the days when women were taking a lot of, postmenopausal women were taking a lot of hormones, we did see lots of breast density increase. Hopefully now we're seeing much less of that because uh, exogenous hormone replacement therapy uh, is associated with a somewhat increased risk of breast cancer. Um, the answer is that it's largely genetic. There are not a lot of uh, lifestyle changes that you can um, make. Some people suggest that perhaps decreasing your alcohol intake may, might have an effect on your breast density. 
there's certainly data to suggest that decreasing your alcohol intake will uh, decrease your risk of breast cancer. Which brings me to one other thing, which is there are some lifestyle changes you can make to decrease your risk. That does not mean prevent breast cancer or assure decrease, that you will sorry, never get it. Decrease your risk of breast cancer, not of breast density. Decrease your risk of breast cancer. Correct. Correct. Thank you. Um, so, you know, you should just live a healthful lifestyle, decrease the amount of meat, decrease alcohol intake, increase exercise, lots of fruits and vegetables in your diet, all the good common sense things that are recommended for lots of overall health, as Andrea said, take care of yourself, not just with regard to breast cancer, but your overall health. And many of those things will, will decrease your risk of breast cancer. And again, that being said, we have no way to prevent breast cancer. And so you have to stay vigilant and empowered. And uh, the way we try to deal with breast cancer optimally is to find early curable breast cancer. I hope in years to come that we'll have this discussion and uh, we will have ways of preventing breast cancer. We're beginning to do that. We're beginning to have really significant uh, risk reduction particularly for high-risk women with uh, anti-estrogenic therapy, things like tamoxifen in the right patient populations. But until we can prevent breast cancer, really what we have to do is find early curable breast cancer. And that's what the Brent Foundation is all about. And that's what your personal education and advocacy should be about as well. Thank you. I just wanna add that there are, um many not yet available, but many emerging technologies that are focused on risk assessment, that our understanding of risk in terms of whether you're gonna get breast cancer is going to improve over time. I don't think you know, right now there's anything massive to report, but that you know, there are a lot of companies and researchers, scientists working on understanding risk. And that brings us to something that the Brem Foundation always stresses, which is personalized screening, right? The screening that's right for me might not be right for my neighbor or my friend um, because it really does have to be based on risk factors. These videos didn't emphasize that, but our first PSA pushback was all about personalized screening. So know that it's not a one size fits all and that um, you know screening really is, the regimen is based on your personal risk factors. Okay, we have another really good question. If I'm in my twenties, how would I even know if I have dense breast tissue? I've been told I don't qualify to get a mammogram. That is a great question. And just like Andrea was talking about a lot of emerging technologies um, for risk uh, assessment and, and my risk as opposed to population-based risk, there are emerging technologies, something called ultrasound tomography that will allow women who are younger than the age of 40 or younger than the age of mammographic recommendation to determine if they have dense breast tissue. So ultrasound is now being developed to not only find cancers hidden in mammograms, but to determine breast density um, in women uh, under the age of 40. So that is a great question. Right now, even if you do have dense breast tissue, unless you're in a higher risk group, family history, women of color, uh, or other groups, then uh, starting at the age of 40 and finding out whether you have dense tissue at the age of 40 should, should be sufficient. But your question is excellent, and we are working on I believe soon to be available technology that will allow women under the age of 40, the knowledge without radiation, whether they have dense breast tissue or not. And I just wanna uh, comment on something Andrea said about personalized risk. So it's really important to realize that what she's talking about is instead of saying, well, I'm 40 and you know my grandmother had breast cancer, what's my risk? We are using genomics and radiomics to look at your mammogram and determine your risk based on your genetics, uh, mammographic appearance, and, and even on uh, ultrasound findings uh, with this new emerging ultrasound tomography. A lot of it is at the molecular level. So it's not things that you, know, you could know from a family history or you know, other things, and it's gonna become increasingly accurate. So I, I personally am very excited about uh, these advancements. Um, we thank you for that question. And I, I want to add one thing. If you are in your 20s and you're as diligent as whoever asked this question is, keep doing self-exam. The Brand Foundation can help you find the best video tutorials. We have our own. Um, just you know, know that that self-exam saves a lot of lives. 
Um, okay, another question. What's the best surveillance after a breast cancer diagnosis and treatment completion? That is a great question. Um, so first of all, annual mammography. Uh, oftentimes in women who have a personal history of breast cancer, their risk of developing another breast cancer is, there, is substantially higher than the general population. And so the highest risk women we uh, screen with a mammogram and an ultrasound at one point and an MRI six months later. And the data, the scientific data has been compelling in the importance of using this type of screening technology to find the most and earliest cancers uh, in women uh, who have had a personal history of breast cancer, women who have a history of atypia or other high-risk lesions, um, and even in women with extremely dense breast tissue. So uh, the answer is the most intensive surveillance program involves a mammogram and an ultrasound at one point and an MRI six months later. For the right person, that's the best uh, screening algorithm. Thank you. Um, okay, we have one more really great question. If anybody has any more, we're gonna wrap up by 145. So keep, keep them rolling. We'll do a speed dating breast cancer question session. Uh, is thermography a reliable form of screening? Excellent question. The answer is simple, no. There is no data to support the improved detection of breast cancer or anything about the efficacy of thermography. I love new technology and I will embrace any new technology as long as it's scientifically based. And the other real travesty about uh, thermography is some women hear about it, it's, um, it's commercialized, it's, uh, you know, it's discussed, and then they go and get a thermogram instead of an, a mammogram or an ultrasound which work. So they lose the opportunity to find early curable breast cancer. There is no scientific data to date uh, confirming the efficacy of thermography. All right. Going once, going twice. Have a wonderful weekend. Thank you all so much. We are here for you now and after this program anytime. As you know, breast cancer is not relegated to October. Um, you can reach us in many different ways and I'm happy for you to email me personally. I am Andrea at bremfoundation.org. Um, have a wonderful day and please share and uh, spread the word. Thank you all for joining us. Be well, bye-bye.